Uh, welcome to the Masters of Automation. Um, today's guest is Joy Montfort. So thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. Jo so is one of the women pioneers of technology. She is an internationally recognized leader in design, particularly human computer interface, user experience and interaction design. She had built and led the world class design innovation teams at Apple, Ford, Akamai, Yahoo, and internal research. She designed interfaces for various systems, including uh, uh, airplay uh, cockpits, computers, the web, consumer electronics, musical instruments, and toys. Some of her work, like uh, you, may, you may know QuickTime, Apple Search, or Macintosh Finder. Um, she's an inventor of over uh, 28 key patents, granting multimedia and human uh, computer interaction. She focuses on enabling technology for artists in music, theater, the visual arts, and movie making as well. Her collaborative work in art and technology uses new techniques of generative data visualization. She created the International uh, University Design Expo, which has touched the lives of thousands of design students for more than 20 years. And she has given and invited to presentations at the top conferences in the field. She received the Woman in Leadership Award in 2019 and received the SIG CHI Lifetime Practice Award and was elected to CHI Academy in 2012. Uh, that said, um, again, it's a pleasure to have you and have the time to speak with you. Um, and also ask you my questions uh, today. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you very much for joining. So the, 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 to kick things off, um, so as a pioneer uh, in your field, how, how did your journey begin uh, that led you to explore the human computer interface and then what led you to explore this field? So interesting question. My undergraduate degree was in cognitive psychology and then um, I was interested in moving overseas uh, and I thought America was a very positive country, very uh, happy people. So I applied to go to graduate school in America and they had this program in aviation. And I thought, well, what a fun thing we could, I could learn to fly. And so I applied for that program and um, that was called in those days, man machine systems. Um, it was also attached to a, a sub program called aviation research or aviation psychology. So I got a scholarship to go to the University of Illinois to study that. Um, and when I got there, uh, people asked me how long I'd been interested in aviation. And I said, well, I haven't. All I'm interested in is actually coming to grad school in America. And I thought flying might be fun fun because it's a complicated machine and it would be great to be able to learn how to do something difficult. Up uh, So then I learned how to ride horses and I thought, well, learning how to fly higher, faster would be better than just a horse. So I moved to learn to do that in America in the middle of the Midwest. So we called it Man Machine Systems and I remember thinking that was kind of a little bit old fashioned. Uh, in those days, we also called it human factors. So I thought it'd be fun to have be a woman in that domain and make it more human, as it were, and more uh, interdisciplinary. That definitely needed a name change. Uh, right. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah. And so as so as as we the the builders of the future, um, we are told um, that. But we invest our time today really creates what's next for the children of tomorrow. Yeah. Um, based on your research and what you've seen in the past and what you've seen today as well, like what's the number one thing that today's design thinkers think about differently or maybe poorly? And <laughs> what are some things that may lead to not so good experiences? Well, I think that. It basically we come back to sort of what I call the, the simplest things are still the hardest. So I love listening to my product managers saying, okay, we're turning it over to you to just make it simple, right? And they think we have a magic wand to just wave over something and it suddenly becomes simple. Making things simple 
and or easy to use is probably the hardest challenge ever. Making things complicated is actually very easy. So if you don't actually think of the basics as in a human has to use it, you can get overwhelmed with excitement based upon what technology does. And you become enamored with the actual excitement of, gosh, it can do this wonderful thing. And there's two basic caveats. Is that something people want? And can they actually get the value out of that wonderful new thing that you're so excited by? And if you go back to basics, if you think of something like a hula hoop, which is this sort of big round circle that you waggle around on your hips, I think that's one of the oldest toys in the world. Let's say it's you know, hundreds of years old, if not thousands. Why would it be interesting to waggle something around on your hips? Imagine the product description, circle around hips, waggle. Well, it still stands the course of time. People still like doing it. So you have to think of our products today do hundreds, if not thousands of things. Do people need this extra bell and whistle that you're providing them? So the basic things that people forget are still the basic things we need, which is do people want this? Do they care about it? Or are they delighted by it? It never changes. People don't want, they don't go to sleep yearning for yet another feature in some word processing program or a feature in a um, file sorting program. They go to sleep thinking about how can you make my life easier and simpler? And simpler is the big catch and the most difficult holy grail to achieve. That's that's very true, um, and I think we see that in the products around us um, that they always take off with um, solving the problem, but not solving the problem simply, right. uh, and then sometimes create more problems. Yeah. <laughs> well, people haven't changed basically ever, and technology has. So technology has to adapt to humans. And we have some fantasy that people are going to be adapting and learning. They learn new skills, but they don't actually fundamentally change. I mean, their head doesn't get bigger, their eyes don't grow, their mouths don't change. You know, that, that sort of basic sensory capabilities are still the same. And we seem to think people are going to be able to grow more eyes and ears and mouth or something, or extra fingers. As far as I've known, that's never happened. So we have to adapt the technology to the human and not vice versa. I think that's the um, one area I believe sometimes they try to add maybe even with metaverse and, uh, and yeah. VR equipment yeah. as well to, to take us. Maybe you have an yeah. arm in the metaphors, <laughs> extra, extra right. in the metaphors right. as well. And, and, and for you, so when you were at the human computer uh, interface at Apple, what, what were some of the experiences that you had because you were very fundamental in actually building the experiences that they still leverage today? And then you've seen how people perhaps um, not being able to adapt to the technology as it's very early. So it's, it's an interesting sort of retrospective story because now people can laugh at these stories, but when we first did, for example, QuickTime, people didn't believe you would ever see video on a computer because all video did was basically show pictures that were still. So when we, show, when we first showed video, we had to label it with a little stamp on it that said, had a little icon that said video. It didn't say, sorry, it had a little icon that had a video mm -hmm. image on it. And now you don't put an icon on it because we all know that when you see an image, you could click on it. But we had to label it as click because there's video because people didn't expect that. And when I first remember demoing it to various vice presidents, it was a very small, probably what one inch by one inch uh, icon. And they said, well, that's ridiculous. No one's going to use something that's that small because people in their imagination cannot believe technology will ever get fast enough or capable enough to provide the horsepower that's necessary to provide you know, full screen video or something, right? So they thought of it as just this tiny little icon that was worthless, right? 
However, you have to have a vision that says, imagine this is capable enough to do a movie. So I did a panel at Kai once that said, when computers are TVs are computers, because I thought, well, TV could be on a computer. And people always told me all my life, you know, you're crazy. That's not going to happen. So you, it's the change has got to be about people's ability to imagine computational Moore's law effects without changing humans. Human can, humans can obviously see big images like in the movies. They can process them. It's just a question of what's the computational capability of the box you're looking at. So that's a sort of Apple-ish story because we tried to show visions of what the future could be and also with voice. Uh, we did lots of early voice recognition work. Um, people didn't think the computer would ever be capable enough of understanding people talking to a computer to have enough memory to be able to store the, let's say, speech templates or whatever back so that it could be recognized and have a quote conversation. Now, it can do that. You can argue whether it's conversational enough to represent you and me talking, but we're getting very close to it. So remember the Knowledge Navigator tape we did in uh, 1984, people, or was it 84 or something like that? Uh, people said, oh, that's impossible because the guy's talking to an agent who's a speech agent. You know, well, we have Siri now. So early signs were there, but sometimes your human imagination is not able to encapsulate that and see what the possibilities will also enable. And together, when you put all of these things, including gesture, we're just beginning to an encounter gesture as a viable thing in, let's say, the metaverse, for example. Uh, gesture, when I talk, I find it very hard to talk to you without using my hands. And, you know, I, I, I'm not going to use them just on the keyboard, for example. It's natural for me to wave at you as if you can understand uh, what I'm saying. But that's part of speaking is waving my hands around at you. Um, so I think we're going to become more multimodal, which is always how people have spoken and communicated with each other. And not just through pointing and clicking. That's hardly a natural human activity. Yes, then it, it does limit the interactions and the communication that we can have across the uh, across the multimedia device. Right. Um, and and it, it's very interesting because the people are sometimes are sometimes against change, and they will they, yeah. they will always be naysayers and then right. make believers because they don't want to change themselves as well. Yeah. Adapt adapt to that technology. So, like, the, um, so I like that uh, one open-ended question because we see that a lot right now within the automation space, especially yeah. like as as uh, robots and and software and humans uh, interact with each other uh, in the landscape of, for example, pizza shops. Right, like you, you will go and you will order a pizza and it will automatically create the pizza and give it to you, or restaurants without servers, or maybe the um, self-driving cars as well. So yeah. the taxis that are self-driving. So I think so at, at some portion, the human to human interaction is very valuable because it, it creates the bond between us um, and the strong bonds to connect. And then sometimes that is from companies' perspective that focus on more on efficiency, consistency, and sometimes less interactivity. Um, may sometimes lead to bad experiences. So like as, as the humanity continues to find ways to do, build a boost, uh, sorry, here, customer experience with automation, um, what is the do you think future is waiting for us? Do you think like people want consistency and efficiency over interactivity at all costs? Um. I think it comes down to the task you're doing and the time frame that you're looking at that task. One of the things I think has been sorely underused is the power of audio. We keep mm -hmm. trying to use vision for everything. And you know, vision is terrific. We all love a good movie and all that. But the best way of improving the visual quality or perceived visual quality is to improve the audio of the movie. 
So that makes people think the visual's better and the work we do in audio is relatively limited as interface specialists. Um, we're now beginning to use, um, let's say, spatial audio, but it's been undervalued. Uh, we did a Sonic Finder the first year I got to Apple. And when we stopped producing it a few years later in the Finder, we were asked what happened, um, what's up with the quiet Finder. So people default to assuming the audio is very loud, but if you put it in the background, it becomes very useful to people because as I said earlier, we're multimodal, but we also need to use multimedia, which actually means more than vision, it needs sound. And the other parameter is tactile. Now we have not even scraped or scratched the surface of tactile feedback. So it's a very evocative feeling. So if you're in metaverse and you're touching people, I don't, I mean, let's say you're reaching out and you and I touch each other. We need to feel that we've touched and it can't just be bonk or something that the computer says. It has to be something that you feel. And we have not even thought of how to provide feedback on our fingertips yet. Now we can do that um, with many suggestions about how Apple is very good at doing that with an iPhone. When you move into certain areas, it'll go, you know, little vibrations. Yeah. And that's all you need to give a sort of evocative connection with another person. So when you ask the question about what sort of applications that we'll do using virtual reality or whatever, uh, I think it's to do with using things that we can't do successfully today, such as um, big tasks, planning tasks, collaborative tasks, but it has to be associated with using feel, um, like planning garages or uh, architectural spaces or something of that nature. Um, but I think we over predict what we're going to do. So it becomes like virtual reality for everything, as opposed to select the things it should be used for. And I also think there are subtle things like voice, um, uh, the fatics, fatics are missing in almost all voice connections. You and I communicate a lot with uh, pauses, noises mm, you know and almost none of the voice agents use those noises to help us feel that we're engaged in a con a communication so while I'm talking you can go mm -hmm, which helps me know you're still listening I don't know of any real voice agents that do that they literally think of voice as just voice and not fatics fatics are important so I think the thing we should be doing is opening up all the channels for input and output and we're still sort of halfway there. So I think that will be a big um, phase in the next um, 10 years, let's say. And also computers are kind of dumb. I mean, remember they only give you back what you put in. Uh, I had a project with the students one year about design a computer interface that makes you laugh. I've never laughed at a computer except in utter frustration. Um, <laughs> And some of the answers you get now from whatever your speech system is sometimes mishear you and give you some funny comments. But mostly that's sort of error, not actual sense of humor. So people say, well, I hope that the skin will look real. I don't think that I care that much that the bot has a good face. I care about whether they have a sense of humor. And I would be happy to work with a bot that actually has a sense of humor. I don't think people are working on those human qualities that I would love to be engaged with. Yeah, that's that's very interesting you say that. And then I've been I've been checking some of the the generative AI technologies as well. Right. Um, yeah. to and then and they were you're able to write a few sentences and write your blog box, but also there's a chatbot interface that speaks. Also, the art portion about it um, to generate imagery yeah. that can be interesting. So, it's, um, so in a way, if those two combined and said maybe into the, the computer, um, right. and and then AI can start generating those yeah. humorous comments on the right. spot, um, it can it can be much more interactive interface like a digital assistant. Um, well, I think that's the key here is that. We're basically lazy. 
as mm -hmm. people. So we'd like the hard stuff done for us, right? So let's pretend you're a, a designer doing endless Figma screens. I don't really want to keep hand doing numbers of versions of screens that need to be done to make a product, let's say. So the computer should be super easy for them to do that. But we have to give it enough knowledge where we know when to get involved and steer it to the next level of change. And I think we are yet to do that. So let's look at autonomous vehicles, which I worked on for a couple of years at Ford. Um, the worst combination in driving, people say, oh, a car can't do that. The cars are really good at doing autonomous driving, despite the fact everyone argues they don't. They do. The problem is, is when you have drivers with driverless cars and the combination is a disaster because a car that's autonomous is way more cautious than a human. So it slows down, it does all the right things, but drivers who don't have autonomy start to try and intercept the autonomous car. And now you have a, a really chaotic situation because the autonomous cars being perceptive, seeing the situation, and I'm rushing to the office trying to cut off other cars in a crisis mode. And then I get into a pickle because I caused the accident, not the autonomous vehicle, but the autonomous vehicle you can blame for causing it because he slows down, she or he uh, slows down earlier than a human. And that's the same as when you have any AI system running with a non-AI system. So let's say I have a generative algorithm working with one that's not generative. It's the clash of those two worlds that I think is gonna be very challenging for humans to coexist with. And I don't know how you manage that. You know, do you put a green light on when it's generative, a red light on when it's human? What's the co-mingling of those two worlds work? I think it's very interesting to do that. And then the other part is it's like, pilots and co-pilots. Uh, the world of flying was uh, also torn with that because co-pilots um, will land a plane much more effectively than a human. But people in the plane do not want to have the plane landed by a non-human, although it's safer. It's exactly the same story with cars. However, there's always that one story, you know, Sully Sunderberger, what his name was, that landed the plane, big hero. And so they say, well, that's why we need a human because he's a great savior, right? There are occasional great stories which save the human at the end of the day, which tell a great fable for all pilots for the rest of their lives. You know, it's uh, people, people love a good story. They also love a hero. So I don't know how to argue effectively, but I do know that we will have to legislate these things in the future. I think insurance and legal matters will come in to be way more relevant than we thought. And they're very difficult right now in lawsuits because who wants to be the manufacturer of a car that caused the death of a child? No one. And that legal battle is about to start in sincere situations, right? And once the widespread, and I, and I was talking about once the widespread adoption start to occur, we, mm -hmm. then then we will I think start to see more of those outlier cases where human saving or or maybe right. even robot saving <laughs> you yeah. know, the no, I, saving. I mean uh, hundreds I mean thousands of people are killed by drunk drivers and that's the fact of the matter and autonomous vehicles will save those people technically from being killed mm -hmm. and that's the biggest killer of people on the road is people who are drunk, not autonomous vehicles going out of control. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but it's sad That's because true. people don't want to know that. But this is all, it's very interesting, I think, dialogue because it does get into legal and political situations that we're now voting on, which means that the world of design is going um, way beyond what we thought it was going to be involved with. Um, I mean, Ethics, I think, and design is now a very interesting question. Um, we can we can argue about, you know, is this a representation of an orange? Is this a true orange? Did you represent it as a cherry that should have been called a lemon? You know, we can talk about those things. Now we're talking about cars uh, who, let's say it's a Ford car 
with a Lamborghini sound? Is that ethical design? I don't think it is, but I'm not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Who makes I, these decisions as well um, at the end of it to, to enforce new principles that, that can adapt? Well, and, and I don't believe that any university, I'm involved in a, a big project right now about um, standardizing education across the world right now on what we call a design degree versus a computer science degree, et cetera, and what are the core things we need to teach for all, quote, design students. And I can tell you Northern Europe is different than, you know, let's say um, Brazil, it's different than, uh, than America. And these questions like ethics are not even on the agenda for these classes, because in order to be a class that's approved, you have to have typically several years of the teaching material that's been approved. So education lags behind in relevance because of the approval from the deans and the universities and the curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. And our students are coming in. I mean, I have interns every year of my life over many decades and they're still wholly miserably unprepared and the unpreparedness comes from them not looking at what relevant questions are out there because the curriculum is not vastly not relevant but the other thing I want to make a plug for is students don't know how to read and they don't know how to write so when you ask them to do a summary they're not really sure what you ask, what they, what you want them to do, and it's it's becoming almost beholden to every single worker now, or manager, to teach the most basic skills. I mean, I have to write outlines for people to say fill in information under these headings, which is something I would I don't think I would have ever expected me to do, let's say thirty years ago. Christine, I think there's the the education also led to be a bit more focused on functional skill yeah. sets yeah. And, yeah. and then that well, had an well, opportunity it's the, for us. It's the T problem, right? So people are sort of almost so thin on the top now that you're not sure what they're good at. And there's, there's no depth. So you're like fumbling around saying, well, what are they? You know, is this a dessert or is it an animal? It used to be what type of animal? And now we're saying, is it a food or is it a... Uh, species you know you're like struggling with naming it at all right and i think that really poses another problem because um the current students are going to be the um, future founders or future builders right. of products and, and once they have the that ability to create then will they actually start to focus on the ethics of how that product can impact or, or what would be the legislation should be right. around the products that they build. And, and we see that even happening today based on some of the products that are already out there. Yeah. I, I always uh, found fascinating that um, in, in different parts of the world, the technology has different uh, reactions to it. Um, and and, and I'm curious some of your opinions around this as well, um, um, especially um, so as a small example, right, self-driving cars. Like I think driving in the U.S. is very well structured, like the roads are cleaner, the roads are, uh, I think people will respect the laws a little more than the other, uh, but in the other some parts of the world, there are um, motorcycles that <laughs> rush around and that and go through. So, so do we? in some ways want AI to be the perfectionist to get that follows the always the control principles or do you want it to also adapt to the place and and location and and I and I'm curious some of your thoughts around this for self-driving and beyond. Well I think you're asking an incredibly useful and difficult question obviously. Um, so let's think about one example that fascinates me now is the way they're managing COVID in China. So apparently they, I don't know because I haven't been to China to do it, but they have a, a color sticker that is with you and it monitors 
whether you've been in contact with people who have COVID, right? And it changes color, right? So when you want to travel, they look at the sticker and they say, no, you've been in touch with people who have COVID or not, right? And then you can get on the plane or not, right? If you've been in touch, you have to be quarantined for a week or I don't know what it is this week, but it used to be two weeks, right? So what that implies is that you're honest, you're being monitored 24 hours a day, right? So my the person who told me this is from China. He is Chinese. He works for me and has for the last five years or so, right? And I asked him, well, do you know what that implies is you're being monitored all day long? And he goes, yeah, right? So I said, well, doesn't that worry you? And he goes, no. So if you asked an average American the same question, you know the answer, they they've, would say, of course, right? Of course that worries them. Of course that's not appropriate, right? Well, the question there is, well, there's many questions, right? Uh, would, well, the, the, the risk of COVID may be worth it for some people, right? And if I had the choice to opt in or opt out, then I might want it or not. But the choice for the Chinese people is no choice. You're either in or you're out. And out means not in the country. It doesn't mean out of the COVID sensing. It means you have no choice. But people in China have a different assumption of control. Like you say, you know, AI watching you. Well, it's the same as the government, let's say in their particular case, or obviously they're using other sensing technology too, not just the government. But it depends what you brought up with. And, you know, you can argue that about certain rules that we have about what books you're allowed to read now in school. Uh, I don't know. What, it's a slippery slope, right? Are we going that way currently in, in politics? Yes. Uh, are we aware we're going there? Maybe. How close are we to the same sort of thing that other countries have? And do we all want it? Probably not, right? But that's because we were brought up with something the other way. And I don't know whether you, I mean, do I want a robot monitoring my house, which I pretend I have with ring bell or whatever it is, right? I mean, yeah, because I think my house is valuable. And I don't want someone coming in. But then you can also say, well, now people have got access to knowing where I am all the time. I think people need to understand the choices. And I think we're now in a society with our own belongings, with our own security, with the own privacy issues, where we have to be more knowledgeable about what they are, what, what's implied by those, um, what, what we're giving up, to know what we're getting back. And I don't think it's clear to the average person. So I'm working on a project right now to try and make those things clearer. Now, the problem with that is, do you trust what I'm gonna tell you? And I don't know how to make a company trustworthy versus not trustworthy. People believe Apple's trustworthy. However, you can look at things they've done and say it wasn't trustworthy. You can do that probably for all companies, right? I don't know the answer, but we know what the, the values are that people have. And I don't know how you establish that. I don't know at all. And I good luck to someone who pretends they do because people are fickle. And they're also viable. And if you're not a person that's um, got enough freedom to make choice by money, you're going to get sucked into doing things and get money for giving up your privacy. And that is really depressing to me because that's not what I certainly want in society. But I don't know how I will endeavor to take myself into that kind of situation to make the world a better place. I don't know how you do that. It's a very tough problem, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very tough problem to think yeah. about. Yeah. It's the, there's the element of being the source of truth. Uh, right. And then and, and it's, it's very tough to convince them yeah. about, even though it is the truth, right? <laughs> and, uh, and also the shaping of that product or service or, or, or whatever the interface is, uh, based on the demands of the society and what people want, yeah. um, actually. But they change all the time too. Yes. Sorry do. to be annoying, but 
<laughs> you know, you say like when you're a teenager, you don't want any of it. And then when you get older, like you have your first child, you go, oh, my God, I want lots of protection, you know, because I don't want my child killed. You know, so people, that's the difficulty. And you don't know when you actually cross, cross the threshold to change. I think that's right. what's also hard. That is very true because the, the main users that you built the product for is also adapting and then changing over time. And, that, 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 and that's that why we'll always have a job because people are fickle and they also change and they grow and they will always be that way. I don't think there's going to be a time where you and I are static, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what's exciting about interface design because... It's always going to be there. And every little thing that you design, everything you use has to be designed. There will never be no designers in the world. Things are not just going to pop out designed. They have to be done and crafted by designers. And, what, and we talked a bit about the students and the universities earlier. Uh, do you have some like advice for uh, those students to be uh, careful about right now, given the current uh, working climate um, about uh, what is required as functional skill sets and maybe creative skill set and, and maybe even adapting some of the skills that AI brings to the table as well. Um, how do you see that, that part? Well, I, I think since I've done the design expo, I did the design expo for over 20 years. I watched what happened over 20 years, and I assume that past can only predict the future, right? Which is that every year, every student, every year's students told me, and they're from around the world, you know, Brazil to um, China, Japan, you know, Europe, you know, so I say it's pretty international. Every year says, you've never seen this before, okay? Which is absolutely completely not true. Uh, and then the other the other thing they say is um, uh, they come up with the uh, technology of the day. And since 1970, it's been AI. So today we are saying AI again. And we're now maybe at turning point to make AI real. But AI is not new <laughs> at all. And every student, my, my current interns say, no, this is real AI. So they add a word like real or very or true or whatever it is to something. Uh, by the way, the other one is VR. We were doing VR in the 70s as well. So I think what's important is not to complain as an old person that the young people don't look at the older work, which I do. But I think what's important is can you learn from the mistakes? So it's not to do with look at this old people's work it's look at what worked and what didn't work because things did work in the old world and they also did fail and if you look at failures and successes that will determine somewhat if not mostly what continues to succeed because people don't radically change in 20 years i'm still alive right so you should just point out to the that first of all there's now become um, some classes now in the history of um, HCI or, C or CHI, however you want to put it, to t tell students that because it is useful to learn things um, because you can see what didn't work and what did work. So that's one thing I think they really are sorely needing to do because it'll speed up your creative path. It's not that it slows you down, it actually speeds you up. Because as I say, you know, children don't learn to walk just by saying walk. They learn to walk by falling down. So you will only learn if you make mistakes. So making mistakes can also be learned by reading what other people's mistakes were. Um, so everyone always wants to just succeed all the way through. I think it's the first to fail that will succeed. So the professors need to learn how to mark failure with an A grade, not mark success with only A's. Um, so I think that those are sort of cultural things 
The other thing is that they get A's for uh, a tool they've learned. I'm an A program uh, in Python. Well, whoop de doo by the time you're a manager in a company, Python will be obsolete. So why don't you learn how to do mobile apps or whatever, not Python or what, whatever the tool is, right? Because whatever tools we used when we were growing up are not, used, not even heard of now. So be aware that that would be true for you too. So don't be a tool snob because everyone comes to me and say, oh, I only use, you know, you know, uh, you know, C++. I'm not a C programmer. It's like, oh, there's a big difference between C++ and C, you know. So I think those little barriers that we make protecting our knowledge is sort of stop it, you know. And I think tools are just a means to an end. You need to say what the end is that you're trying to learn. Are you trying to learn mobile computing or are you trying to learn what people do with mobile computing? Because mobile computing in of itself is not a philosophy of life. We obviously use computing in mobile situations and we always have, even if it required us to wheel a computer to the device, right? I agree with you. And then that's like we talked about that it focuses on the functional skills that and people also being influenced by that and focus on functional skill set. And also sometimes when when we take an iPhone, for example, or when we take our some other products and applications that we took them for granted without knowing actually what efforts, failures and yeah. successes yeah. went into building that. So it's right. it's extremely important to understand, know and learn from Right. what actually brought those technologies yeah. to today and so that we build better yeah. uh, future yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so, so that's it. I, I want to thank you <laughs> for, for joining that. I wish we had more time. I can, I can keep going for hours. Uh, <laughs> so I had the opportunity to speak with you. Um, thank you very much for joining once again. Uh, my session was very insightful and a great discussion and then definitely a lot of topics that resonate um, to the to the to the professionals today, but also to the students um, and within with universities for adapting to these skill sets uh, to continue to build the products of tomorrow. Well, thank you. It's fun doing these conversations, and I love helping the younger generation get there faster because we need them and we care about them doing their jobs faster and better. Thank, thank you very you. much for your time.